Uh, I did want to mention that uh, uh, we have a card. So for those of you who know the Grand Rapids Amateur Astronomical Association, uh, one of their leading lights was James Marin, who passed away this last week, uh, two week, a uh, week and a half ago. And uh, so if, if you have had the occasion to visit the GRAAA and take advantage of the Marin's hospitality, uh, we got a card that we're going to send to them. So if you feel like signing it, feel free. So. All right. Uh, so I have tonight for the third meeting in a row the privilege to introduce Gary Ross. Uh, Gary is going to give the short presentation, which is a sort of epilogue to his presentation at Macomb last month. Uh, planetary occultations more. Uh, Joseph P. McBride, who is not with us tonight, also contributed to the presentation. Uh, I don't really need to summarize the short talk because it won't be as entertaining, but go back and read the email. So Gary has recently celebrated his 60th year of astronomical observing. His association with the Warren Astronomical Society dates back to 1962, our first year of operation. After decades of resistance, he finally joined the Society in 2006, becoming first Vice President and then President. He is a dedicated member of our outreach team despite living in Grand Rapids and Lowell. He has yet to give up the life of the mind despite his best efforts. Joseph P. McBride, also a member of the intelligentsia of the Grand Rapids Amateur Astronomical Association, is the second greatest astrophotographer in Western Michigan. And without further ado, I give the floor to you. Thank you, John. Thank you. I love it. I love it. Roar of the grease paint, the smell of the crowd. <laughs> well, now, uh, at Macomb last time, I uh, talked about occultations of stars, generally. And there was a, a subset last month about the occultation of stars by planetary bodies. Now what we will, we, me, who us? Us. I'm not going not to go into asteroid occultations of stars tonight. That is an entire subset and I'm not pretending to be an expert. Not only am I not an expert, I've never successfully observed one. But moving right along. The occultations of stars by planets is a mighty interesting phenomenon and very highly useful even in this space age of probes whizzing here and probes whizzing there in the study of planetary science. Now I said something that was grossly wrong at Macomb. Yes, say what? Wrong. Dead bloody wrong. I made reference to an alleged observation of an occultation of Venus by the moon in 885 CE from Baghdad. That is utterly wrong. I made a hash. It was allegedly an occultation of Regulus by Venus, by the way around here, in 885 CE from Baghdad. Jonathan, with all the subtlety of sodomy on the MTA at rush hour, informed me that I was wrong. And by God, he was right. I was wrong. <laughs> no, no, this is analog, man. Sky and telescope, right? When I put this book on my head, I cannot feel the knowledge going into it because it is so large, my neuroreceptors are not big enough to accept this book's format. Uh, give me a break. Right? Well, it works when I put the observer's handbook up there, all right? But this does not work. Now, 
Well, don't ever change your ledger back. Yeah. In, in 1874, this is from October 1959. And, and by the way, Mr. Chairman, Program Chairman, this, yeah. thing, this thing is front loaded. Do not hesitate to give me the book, right? Because the most important stuff comes first the mea culpa. <coughs> All right. Baghdad, the Arab astronomer Ibn Yunis tells that on September 9th of that year, in, eight, uh, 1880, uh, in 885, that, that year, that Regulus appeared to be occulted by Venus one hour before sunrise. In 1874, cutting right through this, uh, the uh, English astronomer Hind, using Leverrier's table, said, no, no, it was only, it wasn't an occultation. The two objects were 1.7 arc minutes apart. However, Jonathan, God love him. Where, where is he? Where are you, Jonathan? Yes, Jonathan, I'm nothing without you. <laughs> I, I'm nothing without you. He pointed out that even Eunice did not operate out of Baghdad. He was a Cairo boy, and there is no evidence in the historical record that he ever went to Mesopotamia. So somebody's got it wrong that Ibn Yunus not only failed to see the occultation, but the occultation wasn't at Baghdad. Who the hell knows who saw what? And what the, they may have seen in the Far East cannot say. So that was all wrong. But there are other stories to tell. Ninth century confusion. That there is a, the, the, the life of Ibn Yunus is, is not that well known, but he was a prominent man in his day in the ninth century. But where he got, where historians got the idea that he observed this, who can say? The medieval records translated I don't know, a garble. Who can say? Now, 20th century reprise. Occultation of Regulus by Venus this month, July 1959 Sky and Telescope. I'm not going to read this whole introductory article, but we had the chance, not in North America, because it was a mid-morning event, had the chance to observe an occultation of Regulus by Venus in the Eastern Hemisphere. This article details all the station's established observatories at, at, in France, Spain, in, uh, in Italy and uh, the American University in, in Lebanon. Now, I must admit that maybe I'm just a lazy observer, but I cannot find any subsequent record in Sky and Telescope of what happened for this event. Because in 1959, to observe Venus a, cult, a bright star like Regulus gave a valuable opportunity to study the planetary atmosphere. That, that the, 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 the murk and the brilliance of the atmosphere of Venus is something that had defied astronomers since the beginning of telescopic observations. That I recall uh, having read to me a, a rather sad report coming out of the uh, ALPO, the American Association of, uh, wait, the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, with all it, a complete lack of guile, pointing out that there was no way to, to collate the observations, these are visual observations of Venus, because the object was so bloody difficult. So 
to have Venus occult a bright star gave a marvelous <coughs> opportunity to study the planetary atmosphere. I am unwilling and frankly uh, too lazy to try to muck out from foreign journals what the results of that event were. That with a vast number of, uh, of <coughs> observatories, there must have been some result. Sky and Telescope did publish a very short note. An Italian amateur astronomer, a, a man of some energy apparently, did observe it with a 60 millimeter refractor and sent his timings to Sky and Telescope. But what I'm talking about are the results in the scientific journals. I suppose that some of you would be happy to work on this, of course, for the price of a pint, because that's, his, that's my highest bid. But I would be interested to know what was learned from this. As I say, to repeat, in the Eastern Standard Time Zone, this is the 7th of July, 1959, the sun was very high in the morning sky. The event was really difficult to observe, I have no doubt, unless one was on some pristine mountaintop and uh, where we're going to find something like that in the Eastern Time Zone or the Central Time Zone, God only knows. Question? Yeah. It strikes me that it would make quite a difference. I mean, Venus uh, may have been in a crescent phase for this event. And if it was, it makes quite a difference whether one would be observing uh, Regulus being occulted by the dark part of Venus, which would be much easier to get data on the atmosphere, versus the sunlit side. Yes, I'm sure of it. Do you know no. which it was? No, okay. <coughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't put the, uh, I didn't put my back into this enough to know what phase Venus was. But that would be a much expanded talk sometime. Now, if I get my filthy mitts on the scientific journals for this, maybe we can massage this into something longer, except the clock is ticking on my giving up the life of the mind. I mean, this is a race against time now, right? Because I'm getting tired of all this, you know, deep thinking. You know, I want to watch reality television and drink <laughs> Bud Light. <laughs> 1962, that crazy, wonderful year. <coughs> Do I, is this, does this work? All right. Oh, we were all, we were all head up about this. Oh, yeah. Um, we, uh, some of the, uh, the old bunch, went out to the family's uh, cottage in Oxford Township with our uh, homemade Newtonians without go-to, right? No push-to, right? No tick a tick a tick You just looked at it, damn it. No CCD. Oh, yeah, that is no setting circles, that's for sissies. <laughs> Besides, we are looking at Saturn, yeah. right? right. Uh, this was the path. This was the path. The report in Sky and Telescope. Oh, yes, I forgot. The sky was caca that night in southeast Michigan. We just sat around and drank lukewarm tea. This was before the drinking day started. <laughs> Sky and Telescope summarized reports from five observers. In brief, the star is BD negative 19 of 5925, flashed into temporary visibility as it shone through Cassini's division for three minutes. According to Mr. Milan, Remember, there are five observers. A very rapid brightening of the star took place, uh, skipping the time, presumably as the star shone through Anki's division. 
Some of the recorded times are discordant by a minute or more, but the planet was moving at only 11 seconds of arc per hour, hence these amateur timings actually determine the location of the star relative to Saturn with good precision. Uh, there was, this was part of a double header that summer because there was uh, an occultation of a star uh, by Jupiter on the 17th of June, 1962. But this was the one that was of great interest because what is the nature of the rings? Yes, sir. What did these amateur astronomers use to determine accurate timekeeping in 1962? Maybe off by minutes. Minutes! Minutes! Wash out your mouth with soap, as my mother would say. Actually, uh, actually, uh, no, to, to repeat, to repeat, it said, um, some of the recorded times are discordant by a minute or more, but these observers were in different locations. I mean, they weren't all clustered in one place. And I recently got a lecture uh, a few days ago. It's amazing. You think, well, this is all so very far away, and the Earth is so small, and they're not, these observers aren't separated by the diameter of the Earth anyway. It is amazing what location can make a difference in, in some of these planetary observations. Uh, I expressed some. Um, some disbelief, and this gentleman uh, sat there he's a, and told me what's what. That location, it can make a difference. But the, again, what observations were written up in the scientific journals in terms of hypotheses about the, the rings of Saturn, the various densities, I do not know. But it was a widely av uh, awaited event, and I do, did note that most of the observers here were in the western or southwestern United States. Um, it was just, it was very bad that night. It was, it was totally socked in all day and all the next day. Even, uh, I, I don't know how big the, the cloud area was, but we saw nothing. We stayed up all night just in case things thinned out. Uh, I had uh, the uh, six inch uh, F9, uh, um, Newtonian for that, right? Pipe mount, two by four tripod, right? This is my app right here, right? Carbon based. So I am your timer app, Gary, and you have about four minutes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Is that analog or digital? Both. Yeah. <laughs> Organic semiconductors, man. The, the next evolutionary step. Is this, this focus is down? It's a little, it's, it can't quite get enough travel to All right. get sure. <clears throat> Pluto, the final frontier, right? This was a big one. A possible occultation by the planet Pluto. Sky and telescope. Wednesday night, 28th of April, 1965, may offer a rare opportunity for observers in North America to cooperate in observing an event that could establish the size of Pluto. Despite the faintness of the star, this particular opportunity is favorable because the moon will be near new and because the conjunction occurs at a suitable time for observation from the longitude of North Amer longitudes of North America. On the night of the 28th, Pluto will be moving nearly uh, due west in about two seconds of arc per hour. Depending on the planet's actual uh, diameter, a central occultation could last up to 12 minutes, but less for a non-central passage in front of the star. So what happened? By the way, J 
Joe McBride, because the, the, the author of that last article is from Dominion Observatory out in British Columbia. Joe McBride got on the telephone. I mean, he's, he's like a bulldog. And he called Dominion Observatory. And then he called McDonald down in Texas. He said to me, I'm going to start with the gift shop and work up. <laughs> he, he will stop at nothing. I think he'd have to be sunk by gunfire. Where do I go? Now, Joe said that as far as he could reckon, McDonald and the California observatories were just too far in latitude. That as one of the articles says here, that it appears that the occultation would have occurred in a latitude not that far south of South Texas. Now, I don't know what they attempted to do down at La Plata in Argentina. I'm sure they were brought into it. But there's no record of anything coming out of La Plata. Maybe the, the weather was no good. I don't know. That's, that's autumn down in Argentina. But an upper limit. This is publications. Joe got this for me. Publications of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. April 1966, an upper limit for the diameter of Pluto. Just because it was a miss did not mean that the observation that the event was of no value. Because Kuiper, 1950, uh, led to his apparent diameter, led to a diameter of 5,900 kilometers for the planet. It has been suggested by Alter, 1952, following up on Kuiper, that the surface of Pluto may reflect light in a semi-specular manner, which would result in an underestimate of the diameter. In other words, we're looking at a highlight. So the result here is that we have now, we have some idea in 1965 of the diameter of Pluto. The, therefore, the upper bound, the angular radius of Pluto, indicating its diameter to be less than 5,800 kilometers or 3,600 miles. I remember talking about this with the boys shortly afterwards. It was zippity doo da. We finally have cracked the last planet in the solar system. Now we know almost everything. What Joe did is he got on his planetarium software. Well, I got to admit, this stuff is of some use. <laughs> <laughs> and he generated, he generated the path of Pluto next to that star, also showing the yet undiscovered satellites that were all splayed all around. But this was a, a very valuable event in the middle 1960s. And as Joe said, to repeat, it seems like even, even in the latitude of Central America, remember I said before that the Earth's diameter and uh, observer's position does make a difference. I'm thinking, Pluto, for God's sake, you're telling me that you walk across the block and it's going to make a difference in the observations? The man who gave me the little lecture at the Bean Observatory said, essentially, I'm sure that if they could have observed it at La Plata, they'd have seen an occultation. And finally, comment? Yes. Uh, I just checked the currently accepted diameter of Pluto is half of what you had there. That was before they knew that Sharon was there. Yeah. Because they were reckoning in Sharon with they the had, mass. They we do have to We are. All right, that's it. All right, all right. There is one last item. You will never know what it is. I don't care.